is Craig Madden. I'm a proud Bundjalung Gadigal man from the Eora Nation. I'm here at Sydney University on Gadigal land. Jinyura Gadigal. This land is Gadigal. It's customary for Aboriginal people to invite guests or visitors onto our land or country. It's a custom that we've been doing for thousands of years. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging. To any visitors from any other nation or country, to all our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 clans which make up the Euro nation. It's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Hawke River to the north, the Nepean River to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Within the confines of those mighty rivers lie the Eora Nation, and the land of the Gadigal people that we stand on are one of the 29 clans of that nation. So on behalf of our Gadigal mob, I'd like to say, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the University of Sydney. I'm standing on Gadigal country, where the Gadai people have lived, have loved and have educated and exchanged knowledge with others across this great nation of ours for tens of thousands of years. The University of Sydney's campuses and facilities are on the ancestral lands of peoples who have loved and known and nourished this land since the very beginning of time. For thousands of generations, they've shared knowledge, they've exchanged learning and understood how it is to be here in this wonderful place that today we call Australia. If you have a look around the campus, you'll see some remarkable places. Some of those places are buildings like our quadrangle, but that quadrangle tells a different story. Many people look at it and see it as the height of European endeavor. Well, that quadrangle, that building that hosts the Great Hall was built out of sandstone that was quarried on Gadigal and Wongal country with timber felled from Bundjalung country to the north and mortar that was made from lime and shells that was found on site at this place. Our place is full of stories woven together and revealing the many, many, many histories of Australia's first peoples. All of our facilities sit on the ancestral lands of Aboriginal people. There is not a part of Australia that is not known, loved and nourished by Aboriginal peoples of this land since time began. The university stands on Durrick land in Camden, Wongal country in Lipton, Gamilaroi country in Narrabri, Wiradjuri country in Dubbo, and all the way to Bundjalung country in Lismore and Gagadu country in Kakadu. Our staff, students, alumni, continue the tradition of teaching and learning upon these lands proudly. As a community, we come together as one Sydney, but many peoples. Nyunyunganda, Maganiana. Yamakara. Yama. Jingiwala. Warama. Yadama. Welcome. Welcome to the University of Sydney. Good afternoon. It's Jennifer Barrett here coming to you from the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of the land and also to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. I would also like to acknowledge my Dungari ancestors and elders too, and I'm really pleased to have fellow Dungari here today on this session. So, Bujari Gamarua, welcome in Gadigal. My name is Jennifer Barrett, I'm your moderator today, and I work here at the National Centre at the University, the National Centre for Cultural Competence. The National Centre was established to inform, shape and promote local, national and global cultural competence narratives, actions and capability within the wider community and the University of Sydney. It's great to be here this afternoon to talk about justice. So, more than ever, issues around justice are back in the spotlight. Our panel is here today to talk about all things justice, what that means to each of them and to us, what we need to do as a community to experience justice and how they, as individuals, stand up for justice on a daily basis. Whether it is overcoming tragedy, environmental action, or in sheer frustration responding to living with centuries of colonialism, there are calls for justice everywhere. It is my pleasure to be sitting here today with three powerful and passionate advocates for justice. We have Linda June Coe, we have Letona Dunge, and we also have Ian Brown. So, Bajari Gamarua, welcome. 
Now, I'll introduce our panellists, uh, and then we'll get on to some questions that have been put to us. I've been warned that this, this panel will be one of the, the juicy ones this afternoon, given the sort of matters we've got at hand to discuss. So, Linda, to you first. Linda is a proud Wiradjuri and Badu Island Yine woman from Cowra, New South Wales. She is a cultural educator, teacher, activist, and working on a PhD about Indigenous sovereignty. She is a lead organiser and prominent figure in the Black, Live, Black Lives Matter movement in Australia and consistently makes calls for the formal recognition of Indigenous sovereignty. Linda June argues that racism was embedded in Australian institutions since colonial times and that to make societal change, there must be consistent pressure and uprising against an oppressive system. The movement for justice must be maintained. That's the abstract for your PhD thesis, perhaps? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Leetona, wonderful to have you here, um, has been leading the calls for justice for her son, David Dungay, who died in custody in 2015. The Dungadi man died in Long Bay after guards rushed to his cell to stop him eating biscuits. He was pinned to the ground by five guards, screamed at them that he could not breathe no less than 12 times. Did he say that? Leitona has made continual calls and petitioned, put petitions to New South Wales Parliament calling for immediate action to fix a broken system. The tra tragic similarities to the George Floyd case in the U US have triggered a new wave of public anger and activism around deaths in custody. It's timely too for us to be talking about this because 2021 marks 30 years since the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody uh, the, and their final report, which was released in 1991. So, Ian, and I should point out that all of our panellists have just hot off the ground uh, from being at the rally this afternoon. So, let's keep an eye on their hydration. Ian, Ian is an activist and makes repeated calls for Australia Day to be abolished entirely. Ian also formed the Gamilaray Next Generation a group of Indigenous activists who fight for the rights of generations to come. And has also been involved with seeking environmental justice around uh, Indigenous issues too. Okay, so the session begins with a question. And I have one question uh, to, to ask each, uh, for a response from each of you. And it's what does justice look like and how will we know when we have achieved it? So I'll start with the hardest question first. Ian. Me. <laughs> um, I suppose coming from, I guess, my point of view in terms of climate and environmental justice, justice is embedded within our sovereignty, you know. Our sovereignty has never been ceded, um, you know, and we talk about how we're going to go forward and maintain our environment and our, our beautiful mother, Mother Earth, you know. We're talking about saving her for future generations, for our judge and for our babies that are coming through, you know, not only my babies, but all of our babies, you know, um, whether they be Indigenous or non-Indigenous. So justice for me is an all-encompassing thing and justice is never without sovereignty. You yeah. know, it's always, sovereignty is always within the same sentence whenever I'm thinking about justice, especially when we're talking about land rights and our environmental protection and especially climate as well, mm. the way that our climate is evolving. Um, we only had to look at, you know, the thousands and thousands of young, you know, students that took the streets in, in revolt of climate uh, climate change and to really bring attention to it, they, they're very much, um, you know, they very much see that climate change is a very real existential threat, not only to Indigenous people, but to all, all people that occupy in lands, both here on Australian shores, but also foreign shores. Yeah. So. No, thank you for that. I mean, it's also, it's interesting the way many of these issues are not just issues that we're experiencing here, although they're very particular to us, but they're also, um, yes, they're touching on some of the wider international movements as well. So, Leitona, would you have, um, a, an idea about what justice looks like and how we will know when we've achieved it. What would you put to it? <coughs> well, first off, with the starting of Justice for Dave, it was very hard and difficult. You, you have to put your mind together and uh, really think hard and clearly because you're dealing with police, 
You're dealing with screws, you're dealing with the government, and you're dealing with the white man's law. Yeah. And also, I find with the with the battle me and my family has had, it's been very, very strong at the beginning. And with the happening of uh, Mr. Floyd and uh, Mr. Mr. Orc Newton contacted me and put two photos together and he said there's one one thing they died of and that's the only way we're gonna get justice is because it's been, they died of a, a fixation hold and plus the midazolam, that uh, illegal drug. And yeah. also we've been battling to fight those hurdles through that for justice, point not of, of every issue where they took my life, son, uh, son's that's life. Right. And also uh, what I've found out of it all in five years that I've, I've uh, achieved in uh, acknowledging knowledge in this system of the law, the white man's law, a black man cannot ever win in no courthouse. So is what I put myself together, my, the only way you're gonna beat the system here in Australia is go and get a barrister outside of Australia and let them fight national wide. And that's what I'm doing now. I was gonna say that at this speech today, but I wanted to say it out on the media because it's about time we get justice. And that's how I've tackled it, me and my family. So if we're gonna beat the government, let's get the law out, out of Australia because uh, the white man law is only there for no justice. The white man law is only for to kill. And that's mm. how it is. And that's their acts of the yeah. law too. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's interesting that, the, the, that what justice looks like in that context and to some extent what you're talking about too, Ian, is where we see justice being partly coming about through relationships internationally where others have also experienced injustice. To, to the extent that, that we have here as well. So how about you, Linda? What's, what's it looking, what does justice look like for you in terms of your interests and your work? Um, for me, justice has to be grounded in accountability. And um, at the core of that is um, rectifying dispossession. Mm. Um, you know, the, the central cause of conflict between Indigenous and the settler state is land. Yeah. And well, as we can see from 230 years of um, occupation, their lack of sharing the land or even acknowledging our um, inherent right and birthright to this country. So yeah, um, for me, it's about rectifying dispossession in the form of giving us our land back, recognising that um, our, well, our right to self-determination and, and autonomy. Um, it's also about recognising our knowledge systems and our land management practices, yeah. given the, the current state that we're in with um, the climate crisis that we've had, you know, incur since they've arrived here. Um, but yeah, you know, just echoing what Ian said, it's about the recognition of sovereignty. Um, but it goes a bit deeper than that as well, and it's recognising the need for treaties. Um, and mm. formal agreements between us and um, the settler state. Um, in saying that too, you know, a lot of our mob have said we can't have treaties with a government that um, still refuses to hold themselves accountable. So, you know, we've got to discuss things around reparations and what that actually looks like for our mob on an individual basis, given that there are over 500 different con um, clans That's and tr true. tribal nations yeah. in this country. So justice looks differently to each of those groups. Yeah. You yeah. know. Um, for my mob, the Wiradjuri, it's about land back, it's about autonomy, and it's about respecting our rights as sovereign peoples. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in saying that, do you also um, see that, I mean, that there's, there's a growing number of voices calling for justice on all fronts that are actually um, becoming more, more or better informed about some of the issues that not just you, but everyone else has raised as well. So in that sort of broader realm, I mean, you've, it, clearly it's frustrating that our institutions 
of government uh, are, are not responding in a way that's uh, understanding or acknowledging sovereignty. But uh, what else do you think that the broader, the broader Australian uh, non-Aboriginal community is, is picking up on the needs um. of of, of our, uh, our people in terms of going forward? I think they're starting to really wake up to this, the ingrained racism that Australia has been fundamentally built on. You know, um, just in the last 10 years, we've seen an uprising amongst non-Aboriginal people. Just Black Lives Matter protests last year, you know, here in Sydney, there were close to 80,000 people mobilising on the streets, calling for, you know, um, um, once again, um, um, accountability for Jess in custody and the support of um, George Floyd over in the US. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that not one police officer in this country has been, um, you know, charged mm -hmm. or convicted of murdering a black man speaks volumes. And, you know, these issues are, are widespread. They're not just about, you know, these symptoms that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, at the the crux of it all, obviously, is what we're, we're talking about is sovereignty and the need for treaties. And more paramount is the need for Australia to wake up to their racist past, present, if we're going to have a future together. Yeah, so do you think, I mean, actually, I'll ask the other panellists this as well, is, is amongst some of my family, friends and colleagues, there was a sense of frustration as well about how it took Black Lives Matter to, to sort of raise people's kind of understanding of, oh, actually, it's happening here as well. Like there's a sort of, you know, so I think it was it's certainly a really important moment locally and internationally. I mean, you know, there's a, yeah. So would you comment on that, Ian? Yeah, well, um, one thing that we have to remember as well when we're talking about these issues, uh, that these aren't new nuances, you know what I mean? These yeah, aren't new yeah. issues. These are something that our people have been fighting for for decades. You know, we'd we'll, we'll be pushing, um, you know, a hundred years since um, Uncle Anthony Fernando went over to England and, and protested over there at Australia House yeah. about the dispossession and the murderings and the massacres that was occurring here in Australia. And then we jump forward, you know, to 1988 when we're talking about here in Sydney, when we had, you know, 40,000 plus people come out of this and march across that bridge. And it's all for the exact same issues. Then a couple of years later, we're talking about, you know, the black deaths in the custody, uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody Royal Commission. These are something that's been around before I was born. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, and yeah. the fact that this is only coming to light when it becomes a popular trend in an international country like America, and we're following, you know, like America the trendsetter. We appreciate that, but at the end of the day, this is something that we've always been screaming to, but I think it's a generational shift as well. Right. There's generational yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've got younger people who, you know, are coming in and they're more aware of what is going on because of simple conversations that are going on. Yeah. Well, not simple, I wouldn't say that, sorry. I'll say complex conversations yeah. of understanding the emotions and, and the heartache and the trauma that accompanies these issues. They're happening amongst our peers and our colleagues and, you know, individuals that we may meet out in the public. but. It's that generational shift I find that is bringing it to the forefront. And also this, you know, social media and techno technological change. The fact that we have everything within our, our hands reach, you know, arms reach. Mm, that we yeah. go on the Facebook, yep. that we can see that this atrocity happened in America, we see this atrocity happened in, in whatever foreign country. Yeah. And then, you know, people will take the streets to protest, you know, for um, an African American gentleman, and it is tragic. We yeah. also got, you know, Aunt Sunny, Aunt, yeah. you know, our brother there was out here at Long Bay. There's yeah. a couple of k's out the road here. And no one knew his name barely, you know what I mean? And yeah. this is something yeah. that our people have been fighting for. Yeah. But it's taken multiple generations, you know, changes. And, you know, different generations have come through for this to really be a conversation now that, uh, that people in Australia are picking up. Yeah. Um, but. I welcome that as well. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that I reject it, but it, this is something that I welcome because I feel it's the shift that, that is needed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a really good point. Uh, and I'm just sort of thinking too about uh, that, you know, you appeared on Q&A uh, and, and I think uh, it, it was at a time when obviously people were really interested in the relationship between uh, uh, what was going on in Australia and also 
the US and, and I think you, know, you really raise the profile of these issues in a really poignant way and many of us thank you for that and how incredibly brave you were in doing that. But I think one of the things that sort of strikes me is also we, we've got the immediacy of, of um, social media and so on but we've also got the immediacy in that with community, our community is supporting us in, in these very public uh, campaigns, I guess you could call them. Um, I'm just wondering, if could you talk a bit, if, it's, if you don't mind, just about how, um, how, um, how your family has been protected and also supported through this kind of campaign? In, because, we're, I mean, I guess we're also interested in how do we sustain our fight for justice in these sorts of issues? Well, for these sorts of issues, you better be uh, very alert, like at a time when you're grieving, at the first time you hear of, a de of your death of your son or your daughter, well, naturally you're gonna, hey, this, this real. I've gotta get these cameras, I've gotta get these videos. And that was all that was in my mind on that day, to get them and I've got my daughter to ring up my solicitor, got the solicitor straight away. Then I went on from every issue after issue, what I had to deal with these people. And it was very hard for me and my family, and which it is now. And um, I am going through uh, a lot of crisis with the government in different areas uh, because you're dealing with the red coats, uh, red coats, the blue coat. And when you're dealing with them, they always interfere with your children at the same time to put pressure on you, like not to succeed. But I will show this government I'm going to succeed. And why don't he do something for our land too as well? Where they come with their ships, let's reverse it. You go back to where you come from off on your ships and that will clear up the matter. Because you, they come on the land and they just took over. Everything that we owned, we didn't need no one. Because our mother earth had honey, we had our food, Everything was so possible. We didn't need nothing. No e economics. We didn't need to go to school to learn about economics. We already knew our economics of our land and everything and how we lived. And two, that's made me stronger because I was a, I was a rioter back in the 80s to 70s for my land. And I'm still fighting for my land back today up at Dungani Nation. And also I understand that and, um, yes, I've got two solicitors in, in both areas of justice. So, I'm dealing with these two issues, but the main one is my son, because mother is still alive. I can still deal with that later. But to now, I'm dealing with this death of my son, which these people think they're going to get away with. And so what I intend to do is well, if you can't get the government to swing with you, well, move it out of, out of Australia. And because you know that law is a white man's law, they're always going to pull you back, a black man. And they will do anything in, in a little avenue to make you lose that case, no matter what it is, what you go in that courthouse for, for any criminal records or anything like that, it's just a no-no. You're going in the sin bin, that's in prison. And that's where they just put, put them in there. And they don't even put any plans or anything in there for people to be rehabilitated, to come back out. Nothing what was done so ever for my son. And he was kept, he was locked in the cell for 22 hours a day. And only two hours out, or not even that, one hour to walk around a coffin. It's a cement coffin, if you have a look at it, with a drone. It's a cement coffin, they send them around to walk it and they know they're walking their own death around that coffin and that's the last i seen my son when he was walking around the coffin that he was alive until he ate that biscuit so why on earth why don't they get charged because he was alive eating that biscuit mm. and those five prison office guards moved in and just took things in their own hand and mm. killed him. Mm. 
And why don't they admit that they killed him? Yeah. And why don't the government admit that they killed him? Mm. Because he put those traineeship people in there and exercised with that affiliation on, which is a very, very, very cruel situation to be mm. held in. Yeah. It's a death kill. Yeah. I reckon so. That move is a death kill. Yeah. Well, and certainly we've seen that internationally as well, and also in other other examples around around Australia and I think what's also really apparent from what you're saying is again is that that justice it looks it, it looks different it, to, to different uh, to different communities but I, I think from what we're talking about is what's core is is looking at sovereignty but is also looking at those institutions that uh, need to also change in order to um, and, and to acknowledge sovereignty in that sense. So seeing changes in the legal justice system, um, and I guess I mean, so what's is is that something that you can see happening in your work, Linda? In my work. Yeah, or in your um, your activism, your approach to. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's something that we call to account, you know, when we're um, talking about sovereignty. It's about the issue of terra nullius that's ingrained within these institutions as well. Mm. You know, fundamentally today, we, are, we still don't exist. And, um, you know, um, in many ways, that terra nullius canon is still being pointed at us every day. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, these systems or these institutions are, you know, erasing us, you know. Erasing us with racism. Exactly. Yeah, so it's that sort of, that, that trying, so again, coming back to that question of what does justice look like? It looks like changes to law around land uh, and also around, as I said, those other institutions, but it's, it's also, um, it, I mean, I, if we talked about time, I mean, you're seeing it in your lifetime? Uh, I don't believe I will. Yeah. I honestly don't believe I'll see justice in my lifetime. But we will plant the seeds yeah. for justice right. today, just yeah. as the, you know, our ancestors have before. Yeah. And with each generation that comes up, we will get closer and closer to achieving justice. You know, um, in all honesty, if I could foresee what justice looks like, it's about abolishing the system and starting again. Mm. You know, um, abolishing all the laws, exactly. white man's laws. Let's make a change and put our laws in there with it. It should make a great change. It's also like the but approach. If we work together, not be um, racism about it. Oh, we better do it this way. Mm. We'll beat them out of that. This race mm. or this race or etc. It goes for all migrants. Our you know, it's not right. That's right. It's not this system is not right. That's yeah. Exactly right. So I'm, just, I'm wondering too, um, in, in terms of the role of a youth in sort of activism um, amongst the young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, groups that you're working with, with your campaign, yeah. the Gamble Means No campaign. You, can you talk a bit about that, that campaign and what, what it's doing? Because I think that's, that's obviously key, is, is generations to come, you know, yeah. in, in sort of engaging with with thinking about these very issues. Of course. Um, so in regards to our campaign in relation to Gamil Means No, a lot of what we're calling for is is proper consultation with, with um, Gomoroi, Gamilaroi, Gamilaroi Mall mm. to come down and sit at the table and not us going to them and asking for mm. permission, you know what I mean? And like Linda June pointed to Terra Nullius, in my eyes, it was complete lie, it's a fallacy, you know what I mean? Like this whole, continent was built on a lie and yeah. at the end of the day we were sovereign nations you know multiple nations you know 500 and then we go from language groups in the dialect groups and the diversity of course yeah. all of this country um, really plays into that and the fact that our youth they're the, they're the ones that are going to inherit it and I, I say that at, at our rallies at our protests is that you know look I'm not up here fighting because I could I see justice happening within my lifetime because I don't. I'm fighting because mm. I don't want my grandchildren, you know, and my great grannies to be fighting the exact same fight and be out on these streets calling for justice in the same manner that I am. Mm. You know, and that comes with 
proper acknowledgement of our sovereign sovereignty as you know first nation people and to what our knowledges are in relation to how we manage our land and and it's re the responsibility that comes with it you know what i mean like yeah. we have a government um both state and federally at the moment that injects money into a police force you know to make substantial changes within within this this society and that's proven that it doesn't work like at the end of the day if you wanted real substantial change to come about you should be injected in other avenues you know such as land development such as social work to really be working with you know like i touched on the point there just before you know like about our prison system like that's just yeah. It's, it's proven to be no good for anyone. Like, we're locking people up, you know, we're treating them like animals, you know. And at mm. the core of it, yes, we are, originally, are come, we are animals, we come from the land, but we shouldn't be treated like that. No animal should be locked up and incarcerated like that. Mm. And that falls back into our sovereign right as Indigenous people that we belong to this land, not the land belonging to us. Mm. And that we should be engaging with that and looking at alternative means to really working with individuals, you know, at a, yeah, well, at an individual level um, to really look at what change looks like. And for the Gamil means no, it's just like, for me personally and for us, Gamilaroi mob and, you know, Gomoroi, Gamilaroi, Gamilaroi mob, different names for our, for our countrymen, but our biggest worry and our biggest concern is to what it's gonna do to our, our main source of, of, of life and that's our water you know we're situated mm -hmm. on the great artesian basin one of the biggest underground water reservoirs in the world um and you know like the fact that we have this continuous assault from mining corporations coming in there trying to rip our resources and our you know like the goodness out of our soils and out of our mother earth is the fact that they're putting all of us at risk you know it's making our climate unstable it's, it's making our land inhabitable you know, and where does the waste come from half of these projects, especially that mm. coal, you know, coal seam gas? Like yeah. that's just gonna run riot for our people and our future generations. And that's where a lot of our, our campaign is embedded in. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, and there's a much uh, greater sort of interconnection there between, in just what you described, between uh, sort of obviously those, those companies, but uh, not just in terms of what they're doing in terms of mining, but also the cultural heritage that they're desecrating as well, which, which obviously they don't yeah. understand that sort of interconnection between well, that for for. Well, one thing I always think about when I think about Western Western societies is that they put you know human beings on this hierarchy that we're at the peak, and, yeah. and Indigenous cultures, Indigenous societies, we never lived in a hierarchy. It was a whole hierarchy where we were interconnected, and you know, like. We would never pick too much off of, a, off of a berry tree or, you know, we wouldn't take too many yams out of the ground mm. because we know that if we do, then we're taken away from the next person that comes along. And then if we, you know, if we don't, if we don't eat it all, then we leave it on the ground for the, you know, for our, um, our relationship that we have with the animals that come in, you know, they feed off that there as well. So this whole rug, it's not this hierarchy that we're at this pinnacle and that we're, you know, the apex predator. No, we're, we're interconnected with not only the fauna, but the fauna as well. Yeah. And also, I mean, I want to acknowledge here, as we're sitting here, we have Yarbin going on behind us in uh, Victoria Park just here. And it's been, it's great uh, to see. Um, and to hear as, as we're talking, but I also am conscious too just of the heat of the day and how we're reminded constantly of, of country in that, in that way. The, yeah. the climate change has really changed because of uh, the sun.